Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see some. Good to see all of you. I was going to say good to see some of you. I don't know why I was going to say that. Uh, it's good to see all of you. <laughs> good to see all of you. We have been talking about the the value of community um, for weeks now. That has been the theme of this teaching series. And not only have we been talking about it, we have been practicing it. We have been living out the value of community. How have we done that? We have been gathering together as a community. Uh, on Sunday mornings, of course. Um, uh, on Wednesday nights. Um, I have said that this sermon series, which we are now right in the middle of, we're about halfway through, before we know it, it's going to be done, before we know it, it's going to be the Advent season with all the, the lights and the sparkle and the, the greenery. But right now, at this moment in time, I want us to drill down deep uh, in this, as I, the phrase I've used is this culture shifting uh, sort, of, sort of process um, as we study and practice the value of community. So that's what we've been doing on, uh, on Wednesday nights. That's what we're doing on, on Sunday mornings when we gather. Um, I, I, I trust and I've even seen some um, evidence that we are growing more closely as friends, which at the heart of being community, that's, that's what I'm talking about, is that we actually have, have friends here at church. Um, so, so today, so today, uh, a take on this Community Matters theme. Today we're talking about the fact that it's going to work. I know it is. There we go. That community discipleship matters. Discipleship within the community matters. And, and the word discipleship is a big uh, church word that maybe you're not used to, uh, not, a, not a word we use very often. Uh, the word disciple, if we, if we break it down a little more, is still a word that we don't use very often. So if I can make it a bit practical for us today, um, then I think it'll, it'll, it'll help us in this effort uh, to be disciples of Christ. Maybe you think disciple of Christ like that's a denomination, like like that's another another church denomination, and that's true. Uh, but but it's it's the very essence of who we are to be as Christ followers. We're the, we are to be disciples of Christ, and so I think it's important for us today to really really understand that word in a very practical way. Uh, a real a real simple definition of disciple is this, and that is a follower or student of some teacher or leader or philosopher. Now that, that, is, that is what a disciple is. And so I actually have some disciples. But I'm not talking about you. I mean, in the church, like, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and you're a disciple of Jesus, and we're in this together. But I actually have disciples. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about them. Um, I'm going to bring one of my disciples up here. C come on up, uh, boys. Uh, this is my youngest. I have five kids. I have three boys. Uh, I disciple all five of my children, but, but my boys, I disciple kind of a different way because like, I'm, I'm a guy and they're, a guy, they're, they're guys, you know, and my, my, my wife disciples our, our girls, our two girls, in a different, more unique way because she's a gal and they're gals. Uh, but I disciple my sons. In some ways, they're striving to be like me. Not in every way, right? There's some things about me that are broken that they don't want to, I don't want to pass on. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, carry on. Uh, but, but as outdoorsmen, it's kind of a lighthearted example of discipleship, but, but as, as outdoorsmen, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a hunter and a, a fisherman and a, I'm a fly fishing guide. Uh, did that for several years, full time, and now I do it kind of on the side. Uh, but I grew up. That's me, the little guy on that old uh, air conditioner. That's me. I, 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 at an early age, an early age, I was exposed to 
um, fishing. Um, that's my mom, by the way. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, this is, th these are pictures of my great-grandfather on the right and my grandfather on the left. Uh, for generations, we've been down here in the valley uh, farming for a while, but they were, they were hunting and fishing the lower Laguna Madre, and, and, and for many years, they've told me these stories uh, of how they uh, used to hunt uh, and fish in the, like, like within just miles or even just yards of these spots on the lower Laguna, lower Laguna Madre where I, I hunt and fish now, and that's a hard to see picture, but that's a, that's a kind of a lame uh, goose hunt, it looks like. Uh, and then, and you know, that's me, you know, so it comes full circle, and now I'm a, an outdoorsman. So now I've been teaching my sons to hunt and fish the lower Laguna Madre, and, and, and very specifically, been teaching them to fly fish. And so my oldest son, Truett, uh, he's 24 and he's a grad student studying snook out on the, out in the, 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 the bay, uh, but he's, and he's also a, a fly fishing guide. And so I, I he was my disciple and I, I taught him um, how, how to do what I do, to emulate my ways. And then... Um, and then that's Nolan. Nolan's now 13, but that's when he's a little guy. And he started spin fishing. And then he, he started just wading and on his own and fishing on his own. And then, and then now he's a, he's, a, he's a fly fisherman as well. And, and then, and then my, 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 little, my little guy, my nine-year-old, Boyce, he has been hacking away with this fly rod for like two years. He gave up the spinning rod. He wanted to learn how to fly fish like his dad, like his brothers. And then this summer, man, he, he went to town. He started tearing it up. And he caught quite a few uh, redfish on the fly rod. But it took time. He's a disciple. Now, if all he ever wanted to do was sit at home and, and watch fly fishing on the sportsman cha Sportsman's Channel, uh, and, and then like maybe read articles about, about fly fishing, he wouldn't really be a disciple because he's not emulating my ways. He's just got a, just a bunch of head knowledge. But, but he's, he's trying to actually act like me in this way. Be like me. Emulate my ways. I think that's the last picture I have. Uh, oh yeah, this is actually proof that we are actually fly fishing legends because me and Truett, Truett and I, there, see, we did, a, we did the presentation, this was an Austin presentation, and Randy and Truett Caulfield, uh, we did a presentation on fly fishing the Lord of the Lord. But we are fly fishing legends, so I just wanted you to see that. Uh, so you know that I'm, <laughs> and I'm legit. Um, so Boyce here is going to give you just the briefest of, of uh, a little, a little picture of what it means to fly fish. We don't have actual fish. We don't have very, room, very much room. He can cast really far. But right now he's going to show you how... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. You know better than that. Come on. You got to put, put the rod down. See, see, discipling is more than just like showing him, showing him how to fish. You got, there, there are other aspects of it. I'm learning him, te teaching him. I'm learning him. Uh, I'm teaching him how to, how to protect his son, his skin rather, from the sun. Hurry. Fish are, the fish are going to move. Hurry. <laughs> Get your sunglasses on. You've got to protect your eyes. I'm teaching my boys more than just how to actually catch fish, but I'm teaching them how to protect themselves. And I'm telling them, you know, you're going to look like a, you're going to look like a sun-dried prune like your dad if you don't take care of your, son, your, your skin. And it's okay. So now, show them, just show me. We're not going to catch a fish here, but just show them. Don't hurt anybody, but show them how you... Get all that, get all that line out. You can, throw, you can throw twice that much line, but that's, that's how you fly fish. Maybe you saw the, the movie A River Runs Through. Put a little more line out, another foot or two. Just... Uh, that's good. That's good. Don't, don't hook anybody. But. All right. That's a perfect cast. There you go. All right. Listen, you can keep the buff. You can keep the buff if you want. Just wear it in class. It'll be cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Give him one more hand. One more hand. Yay. So when it comes to being an angler, that's a fisherman, um, 
my, my three sons, and, and my, my daughters know how to fly fish too, but, but my three sons are my disciples. And what does that mean? That means that they're, they're students of my ways. It means that they want to copy me. And they want to copy my ways. They want to be like me. That's the essence of being a disciple. Jesus was a rabbi, which simply means a teacher. He, as you may know, if you're a student of the Bible or a student of history, uh, he began his, his adult ministry at about the age of 30, and for three years he had a really intense public ministry that is recorded in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in those three years, he was a rabbi, a teacher, and he had disciples. Uh, he had disciples who he hand-selected. Um, we're going to look at that right now. Uh, this first passage that we're going to look at, this first passage that we're going to look at uh, is Jesus ushering in a new day. You know, we have, the, we have the Old Testament that ends with Malachi. And then we have like several hundred years in which God was virtually silent. He didn't really speak firsthand to his people. There was so much brokenness and there was so much rebellion and no one was turning to God and no one was listening to God. And so God determined that he would, he would, as Eugene Peterson says, he would move into the neighborhood. That, that he would come in flesh and bone, God. He wouldn't give up any of his godness, but he would, he would take on this human form and he would, he would move into our neighborhood, this world. And, and so, so this is Jesus now, at, at the age of approximately 30, ushering in his public ministry saying, I'm here and it's, it's a new day. Great words of hope. And, and so Jesus says, Jesus came into Galilee, which was really like a, like a fishing village. And, and he came in proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. This is a message of hope. This is a message, message of, of Jesus ushering in the new, uh, the, the, the good news, the, this new era, this era of, of hope and, and forgiveness and, and healing. And then in the following verses, he invites uh, four fishermen. You see a theme here? He invites four fishermen to follow him. To be his disciples. Which is what he invites every one of us in this room to be as well. He invites these four, which ultimately turn into twelve. But these four men um, to be his disciples. And this is our calling today. To be Jesus' disciples. And, and, and if you'll notice as we read this passage, notice how this happens in community. In a group-like fashion. So passing along the sea, along, uh, alongside the Sea of Galilee, this is Jesus' old stomping grounds, by the way. He grew up in Nazareth, not far away, and, 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 and he grew up around fishermen, old salts, watermen, if you will. And, and so he, he, uh, he saw Simon and Andrew, uh, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you uh, become fishers of men. As a fisherman, as an angler, that's kind of like God's calling to me, to me, Pastor Randy. Like you're a fisherman, but follow me, and I will also make you fishers of men. Uh, verse 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little f farther, uh, Jesus saw James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They were also known as the, son, the sons of thunder. He saw James and John, who were in their boat, uh, mending their dad's nets. 
And immediately he called them. Um, he called them out of the family business. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. This was a, this was a family business of means. They had employees. He, he, they left that. And they followed they follow Jesus. And this is how Jesus dealt with his disciples most often in the Gospels, in a community fashion. In a community fashion. Um, there are uh, very few, there, there are some, but there are very few examples of Jesus dealing with his disciples in a one-on-one -on -one or individual basis. He calls them, he disciples them, he deals with them, in a community fashion. And, and, and 2,000 years later, that's how our sanctification, our becoming more like Christ, most often happens, is in a community, not an isolated, just me and Jesus, but a community fashion. And then, so that's the beginning. What we just read, Mark 1, is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. We're going to jump way ahead, all the way to the very end now, with this next reading of Jesus' public ministry. He's already uh, gone to the cross. He's already defeated sin and death. He's already walked out of the tomb. And now Matthew 28, we're going to read what's called the Great commission. Jesus' last words, their lasting words, the last thing he's going to say must have great significance. And here's, here's what he says. Jesus came to his disciples and, <clears throat> um, and, and, and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. What is he speaking of? He's speaking of his defeating sin and death on the cross. I, I, have, I have all authority. I, what, I, what I'm going to say now, it, 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 it is authoritative. Therefore, he says, therefore go and make disciples, there's that word again, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them uh, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then Jesus departs. He goes back to heaven. So, so his last words, what he, the instructions he gives his disciples is, you now go, go global with this message uh, and, and make for me countless disciples. And how do you do that? You teach them my commandments, my ways, my instructions, and make of them disciples. So today we're talking about the act of being a disciple, which is a major, major part. In fact, it's, it's the primary reason that we live together as a community. It, the, the primary reason that we live together as a community isn't so we can have friends. That's, that's a cool perk. The primary reason that we get together as a community, that we live together and that we work together and that we, that we, we operate together as a community, the, the primary reason is so that we can become and grow as disciples of Christ. You see, I'm a disciple of Christ helping you. You're also a disciple of Christ. And, and we're all in this together and we're all following one rabbi. One teacher, Jesus. Again, a disciple is a follower or a student of a teacher, a leader, a philosopher. In our case, Jesus. Here's my concern. Here's, here's the, 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 the urgency that, that I bring to the pulpit today. This, this is the pulpit. Um, 
My concern is that in modern day Christianity, and, and especially here at River Church, because this is my jurisdiction. You're my, you're my people. You're like my, my children, right? And so, so here's my concern for us. My concern for us as a church is that we live in a culture of teaching rather than a culture of learning. Now, that may not mean anything to you, so let me, let me unpack that a little, a little bit more. We have developed a culture of, of teaching. We call, it, we call it preaching, like what I'm doing right now. Like someone gets up and lectures on a topic for 45 minutes while everyone else is quiet, mostly. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of preaching. But I think that we can default to a, a mode where, where preaching actually holds us back as disciples. When we do nothing the rest of the week... Uh, to grow as disciples, then we're passively living in this culture of teaching. And what I want to do, it's a process, it's a long process, but I want to do is, I want us to shift, I want to shift us from a culture of teaching to a culture of learning. Now let me ask you, on a piece of paper, if you would write down, or actually just, just with an imaginary uh, pencil, your, your finger, write on an imaginary a uh, piece of paper on the palm of your hand. If you're a learner, if, if you're a disciple, write on the palm of your hand, how many hours have you spent this week seeking to understand the teachings of Jesus? Now, how, many, how many minutes this week have you, have you wrestled with the ways of Jesus? On your own time, not, not here, not here, but on your own time, how, how, much, how much time have you given over, how much effort have you put forth in, 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 in contemplating the radical way in which Jesus lived and how you might emulate, imitate, copy those ways. Disciples, they learn from their leader. And they, they emulate them. Act like them. Now, <clears throat> there are two communities of faith that I'm going to show you right now. They come out of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. There, there are... Uh, there are these, these budding disciples in, uh, in, in, in the city of Thessalonica, and then, that's Thessalonians, and the book of Thessalonians, and then, and then another group in Berea, the Bereans. And the Bible, uh, on purpose, uh, the book of Acts contrasts these two groups. And I wonder, who are we more like? As a church, the, the, the Bereans, you'll see, they were learners. And they had developed a, a culture of learning in the place of this old culture of teaching. But the Thessalonians, they, they were still stuck in uh, a culture of passive teaching. Acts 17. This is Paul. It's a, a Paul was the greatest missionary, and uh, this is about Paul. They came to Thessalonica. They, Paul and Silas, his, his wingman, um, they, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue uh, of the Jews, and Paul went in as was his custom. Last week we read about Jesus doing this. Jesus would walk into a synagogue on a Saturday and teach. And then they would take him home for dinner. So Paul's doing this now. Paul went in as was his custom. And on three, I assume, consecutive Sabbath days, three weekends in a row, 
Paul goes into the synagogue and he reasons with them from the scriptures. He, he, he contends for the faith. He argues for, for the case of Jesus, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And then verse 4 has this, this, this phrase, and some were persuaded. They came in week one and they just, they listened. Week two and week three. Some were persuaded. But ultimately, we, we don't have time to read all of the in-between, but ultimately, let me just tell you what happens. Ultimately, uh, they're fickle. And they, and they, they uh, because of some religious, um, just old baggage that they had, they, they ultimately run chase Paul out of town. He has to leave like under the cover of darkness because they're going to hurt him. So then, so he, he, he knows when he isn't welcome, uh, so he leaves and he goes to a different town, Paul does. He goes to uh, the people in Berea. And again, they're contrasted to these fickle people in Thessalonica. So, so the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. Again, because the Thessalonians were, were going to hurt them. He sent them away by night to where? To Berea. And, and when they arrived, same thing. They went into the synagogue. And Luke, the writer of Acts, says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And then he unpacks why he says that. Here's why, they, he, why, here's why he calls them more noble. He says, They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Okay, so what's going on here? It says that the Bereans were more noble. And why does he call them more noble? Because they examine the scripture every day. And what are they doing? They're not just taking Paul's word for it. They're, they're, they want to see the things that Paul is preaching. Is that the real deal? Like, like what he's saying about Jesus, if what he's saying about, because these are Jews, they've grown up uh, under the law, and now they're saying, if what, if what Paul is teaching is true, then we've got we've to radically change our religious system. We have to go a new direction now. So they would, hear, they would hear the preaching once a week, like you hear the preaching once a week, but then they would go away, and every day, it says, I don't say, they, that's what Luke says, every day they would examine the Scripture. And they would, they would attempt to determine, is this, is this preacher, is he telling us the truth? Is it the real deal? As I've said, I love preaching, and I will keep preaching until God releases me. And, and in my heart, I have this obligation to preach, and, and I suppose God may release me from that one day, or maybe I'll... Maybe I'll climb down those steps one final day and, and die on my way to Whataburger. Uh, but but I, 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 my point is, I value preaching. Um, but today I invite us to move from a culture of teaching to a culture of learning. See, see we strive, my, my sincere desire is for us as a church to be a word-centered church. And sometimes we screw this up as preachers and we think that a sermon-centered church is, is all that. Like that's the bomb. But that's not my goal to make us a sermon-centered church. My goal and my desire is to make us a word-centered church. Well, you guys go and you nourish yourselves and you eat your own meals, figuratively speaking. You feed yourself. And Sunday is me just giving you a big yahoo because you're doing good. Let me, let me give you a few, few more ideas on where you ought to go next. And then, and then I send you off and, and you nourish yourself. And so 
it's, 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 it's a quite informal process moving from a culture of teaching to a culture of learning. But it's, it's super intentional. Let me say that again. It is a, an informal move or process, but it's super intentional. Three ways that I believe a disciple becomes a learner, because this is what I want. There's no, there's no real, there's no real um, sparkle or magic to this. This is just real nitty gritty, super practical. Three ways in which I think that you can become a learner. Number one is solo learning. That's that's. And I'm going to give you examples of all this, but you you're studying the Bible by yourself. The second is uh, learning in tandem. That'd be like one on one, you and your bud, or you and your your, your, your best friend, or you, you get together and you study God's Word. And then the last would be in a small group setting. I mean, like, just in, maybe it's around your kitchen table, maybe it's a Starbucks, but you got like five or six dudes, or five or six couples, or five or six ladies, and you're, you're, you're studying together. So, so what we're going to do for the remainder of our time here is we're going to have a little panel discussion, because I want you to understand really practically what we're talking about. So if my panelists would, would come on up here. They all three are really good examples of the three ways in which a... Yeah, come on up and, and grab a seat. You know these people well. It's Josie and Lydia, my wife, and Enrique. Yay for them. All right. So we're talking about three ways, there may be other ways, but three ways that a disciple, because that's what we are, we're, we're disciples, if, we are, if we're attempting to become, like, now if we're just trying to memorize the, the script, if we're just trying to, to, uh, to fill our heads with knowledge, that's not really a disciple. Any more than my boys if they just stay home and watch fly fishing on TV and read the magazines. But, but here, I trust that, like, sincerely, we're, we, we're attempting to be disciples, to, to follow the ways of Jesus, to allow his life to, like, wreck our lives in the best sense of the word wreck, like, radically, in a wholesale way, change. So, um, I've got some, just a few thoughts that I want to, ask you all about, but being a disciple means wanting to learn the ways of your leader. So as a review, so as a review, if, if, if you are actively seeking to learn the ways of Jesus, then you're a disciple. And if you aren't seeking to learn the ways of Jesus, you know, you come to church and you, you're, and maybe that's it. You know, but you're not only you're actively seeking to learn the ways of Jesus, then you, you aren't a disciple. I mean, it's, it's just pretty much that simple. Um, so, you, so you have to ask yourself, like all of us, am I, am I seeking, attempting to, uh, to align the way I roll, my, my life, with the way Jesus rolls, with his values and his ways? We looked at this passage a few weeks ago, but Jesus one time said this, if you know these things, like if you know my teachings, if you know my commandments, blessed are you if you do these things. Like if you know what I'm teaching, here's what, a, here's what blessing looks like when you do these things. So this is not the metric or the measuring stick that we often um, use for uh, determining whether or not we're disciples, determining whether or not we're Christ followers. We, uh, like an old, an old school, uh, especially in the rural south, an old school uh, sort of measuring stick for whether or not I'm a disciple of Christ is, is just a system of beliefs. Like I hold to a system of beliefs. And, and other people don't believe what I believe, and therefore, you know, um, I'm, I, I fit the bill, and and they don't. And we often settle for beliefs. Um, but, but Jesus says, if you know what I'm talking about, then, then start doing what I'm talking about. So, my first question to you all, this, is, this one's unrehearsed, like, 
Is that, is that too harsh to say if someone isn't really attempting to emulate the ways of Jesus, then they're just not really a disciple. That's just, that's just kind of a fact. Um, a, a truism. Like, is that too harsh? Do you, what do you think about that? Any, 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 anyone? <laughs> you have the mic. You want to go? Yeah, you can go. No, it's not too harsh. Because we want to make our time valuable. And so if we, if we um, you know, say we're a follower of Christ and we're dedicating, let's say, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. to him, then um, you know we want to we want to be getting something out of it, right? So I, I think that um, and 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 hopefully we're beyond just Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Hopefully we're engaging in other ways of of becoming a disciple of Jesus, and and so we want to make our time valuable. We want to use our time wisely. Okay. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> um, I actually, this morning I watched a movie because the boys get up early. It was about a penguin who wanted to be a surfer, <laughs> right? But he lived in Antarctica, so he surfed on ice boards, but he thought he was a surfer. But there was no waves, and they came to scout him. There's no waves. They let him on the team anyways. But he got his first wave, and he totally wiped out. <laughs> right, but because he wasn't a surfer. Yeah. You know, as much as he said he was, he wasn't because he never practiced surfing. He never surfed. He never been in a real wave. He never seen a beach. So when it came to it, he didn't know how to surf. It's beautiful. And he found someone to teach him. And then he started surfing. Okay. So these three panelists are going to pretty much talk the rest of the time. When they're done talking, we're going to be done. I'm going to ask a few questions. So so um, so Josie represents the. Uh, one way of one way of what to, of, of yes of, of learning of becoming a learner in, in a tandem fashion Lydia in a solo fashion and Enrique in a group setting so rather than me unpack it I'll just let them unpack it so Josie here's the question tell us um, about just when you first started coming to River Church and, and uh, about your meetings with, and there's actually Lydia, you were, you were studying in tandem, you and Lydia. What did, what did y'all do? How, those meeting, how did those meetings impact the course of your life during that period of time? How did that tandem, that one-on-one -on -one between you and Lydia, that tandem study go? Um, well, I actually tried doing the GC before I started meeting with her, and for some reason I was always the quiet one. I always felt like, okay, there's a lot more people. Uh, is it okay to say certain things? Uh, you know, and, and so I kind of just kept it to myself. So I felt like I needed something else. Uh, and my husband, George, he had said, well, you should try, you know, asking Lydia because he was actually meeting with you uh, in tandem. And so I, so I got the courage to ask her uh, Easter 2017. <laughs> yeah. And, 2017. Yeah, that's when it. Uh, Put the mic real close I'm to your sorry, mouth. I'm there can you, you hear me now? There you okay, go. Perfect. <laughs> And uh, so we started meeting. Uh, we would meet at the mall because it was kind of like the halfway point from my job and, and her home. And uh, we would come around during lunch once a week. And um, I started unpacking everything. Like it just, I finally felt like oh, I could finally be me and answer my questions. Uh, answer my answers and ask her questions and I had so many questions because at the time that I was looking for I guess the faith that I used to have before and so she really honestly helped me during that time and during that time is when I found out I was pregnant and it completely changed everything like it's like wow now I have someone coming into this world that I feel like I need to represent, you know, uh, the Lord as much uh, to my child because, honestly, like, uh, I, he saved me. Like, he saved me. So I want him to save my son, you know. So uh, that's pretty much what awesome. went on <laughs> through the whole tandem. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Awesome. And here you are. And here I am. <laughs> you, were, you were baptized shortly thereafter? Or yeah, one year? I was baptized two days before my son was born. There <laughs> you go. I had the big belly awesome. and everything. <laughs> and I had the privilege of baptizing you. Enrique, um, tell us about Monday nights 
at your house. Uh, and it's changed a little bit because we've been in with community nights over the last, we've been in it four weeks now. We've all been gathering here on Wednesday nights, including this group. But, but prior to that, tell us about Monday nights at your house. Uh, what do you all study? Uh, does everyone get to talk? What's the format for your time together? How does that go? We started meeting Mondays at my house probably in May. And initially, just a, just a little group of us. And uh, we had one person teaching or just whatever was on their heart. I think we started maybe Ephesians. And we just started going through that book, verse by verse, learning what is God saying through this. And as time went on, um, that one teacher became two teachers, became three teachers, eventually became four Four, four of us were teaching on a rotating schedule, giving everybody opportunities to learn and plan how to do that. And we would teach from a book, or we would teach about something that was going on in our group, about what it looks like. We actually did one on what it looks like to be a disciple. So it was really cool to let four different people though, go ahead and learn and reflect off of each other. And then as we taught, we, there would be pauses, like, hey, anybody have any questions, anything we want to just talk about, sit on this verse for a while. And we get some really good discussions and interesting conversations. Um, we've had nights where everybody just sort of went to a corner and read their Bible and came back with, this is what I read, this is what I thought about. And then after all that said and done, we would pray for each other and share our hearts. And this is probably my favorite part, because this is the time when people just share. And sometimes we share, and it ends up in just tears of sorrow and pain. And other times it's just, man, I'm just so relieved that God's going to get me through this. And it was just a time of people being very real with each other and people sharing what was on their hearts. And then afterwards, we, we just spent some time in each other's company and learning more about each other and just, just enjoying that friendship in Christ where we were, we have just been vulnerable with each other and now we get to enjoy this feeling of like, man, this person is my friend. There's no holding back anymore. Awesome. Lydia. Honey, <laughs> tell us about your personal Bible study. Um, this, your solo about what, what do you what do you study? How often do you do this? And can you tell me one practical way, perhaps your your study has impacted your life? Well, I do try and um, approach my study in different ways, just to keep it fresh and interesting for me and so I, I, I might do a book of the Bible or I might do just a chapter but I also might pick a topic that I would like an answer to so I you know search for answers um, I have studied um, like Bible characters that interest me there's lots of women there's lots of men in the Bible so those are all those are some ways that I've kept it you know, interesting and something that I'm looking forward to each day. And, and I, do, I do spend time every day in God's Word. And uh, so, something that I look forward to. And, and, if, and if I do sense that I'm getting a little bored, feels a little dull, feels a little legalistic, you know, like I'm just doing it to check off my box, then I think about those things like, what's, what's a topic that I might want to know what God says about or what's, who's a person that I'm interested in that's from the Bible and, and do some s research on that. Awesome. And then um, oh, recently uh, I, I have been spending some time in the book of Titus and uh, Titus 2 talks about godly traits of men and women and uh, so um, I've been challenged you know, that there's a list there for men and women. And of course, you know, I'm human, so I fall short of that list. And, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that's why Jesus came to earth to save us from our shortcomings, from our sin. And so, um, you know, again, in that list of godly traits of, of Christian men and women, I see that, um, you know, the re God's plan for sending Jesus to die for me, but also guidelines for me to live by, something for me to aspire to. And um, so I'm challenged, and I'm also reminded of the gospel story. Amen. What do we always say? Who's the hero of the Bible? The hero of the Bible is Jesus. He's the one and only hero. There are subplots in the Bible, but the main plot is Jesus and his redemptive work on the cross. 
uh, rescuing us from our sin and brokenness. Um, I put these people up here uh, in front of you today, not, not to put them on a pedestal to make any of us uh, intimidated, uh, but rather I, I, I put them up here today so that we can all aspire. We can say, I could do that. I, I could do that. You know, what, what, is the, what, is, what is the first step? I think would be the question that some of you might ask. Like, where do we, where do we start? Like, I, I, want, I, want to, I want to make some changes in my life. I want to take this, this idea, this, this calling to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to take it more seriously. So where do I start? And, and I would say that it starts with a, a decision. It starts with the, a, a decision that I'm now going to uh, make this a priority. Um, every one of us has priorities. It, it might be your hobby or your workout routine or, you know, your date night or your, your, your fishing trip. But like, like nothing, nothing's going to interrupt that. And so if you want to be a disciple, then you have to determine, like, I'm going to make this a priority. So, so not to make, uh, not to make a melodramatic move here, but, but I want to do something really simple. And that is give you the opportunity to make a decision right now. Not to come forward. I'm not going to lay hands on you or anything. But if you want to, if you would say, and then I'm going to pray over all of us. And I hope most of us would say this. If we would say, you know, I, I really do. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to, I want to take it more seriously going forward than I have in the past. I would personally say that as a, as a pastor, as a, as, a, as a theologian, you know, as a well-trained man, I would say, like, there's so much more for me to learn. There's so much more for all of us to learn. So I'm going to ask you, in just a minute, not yet, if that's your heart, if you would simply say, I want to be a disciple. I want to, maybe I'm not doing anything, and I want to do something. I want to start taking baby steps toward being a disciple. If that's you, then uh, in just a minute, we're going to stand. I'm going to stand. You're going to stand. And I'm going to pray for us all. And then we'll come to the table of communion. And the table of communion is, it's, it's, it, it, basically the table of communion is a tap out. Like, Jesus, I can't do this. I need for you to do it. Like, that's the, really, that's really what it's a, it's a, I surrender all. Coming to the table is like, Jesus is going to have to do this in my life because I can't do it on my own. So I'm surrendering to Jesus. That's really the act of communion. It's really a symbol. It symbolizes that heart attitude. So I'm going to pray. And then if we all feel like trash, because like, man, I, I never do what I say I'm going to do, come to the table of communion uh, and, 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 and submit that to Jesus. Ask him to do that in your life. So if you want to be a disciple, if you would stand, uh, and, and I'll, I'll pray, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll run to the table of communion.